Uh, in this video, I'm going to go through the AQA A-level chemistry paper from 2020. This is paper three, and this is the second half of the paper. I covered the first half in an earlier video. So this is mostly the multiple choice section. Okay, so the first one is an ideal gas calculation. Okay, so you've got to write the moles of potassium chlorate that um, we had in order to make um, 67.2 centimeters cubed of oxygen from this equation here. Okay, so we need to work out the moles of oxygen, first of all. Um, so we're going to use PV is equal to NRT. Uh, rearrange to get the number of moles. N is PV over RT. And with the idea of gas equation, we're going to be really careful to use the correct units. So um, we must put up units of pressure in pascals, not kilopascals. So that's 110 times 10 to the three. We've got to have our volume in uh, meters cubed, not centimeters cubed. So we've got to divide by a million for that. And that's the one bit everyone gets wrong. Uh, R, the gas constant is 8.31. And T has got to be measured in Kelvins, 298. All right, so we do that, we get a value of 2.98 times 10 to the minus three moles. Okay, now we need to look at the equation. And we can see from this equation there that to give us, that if we have two moles of chlorate, that will give us three moles of oxygen. So the moles of potassium chlorate uh, is equal to that multiplied by two thirds. Because two moles of chlorate gives three moles of oxygen. So. So that multiplied by two thirds works out to be 1.99 times 10 to the three, minus three, sorry. So our answer is B. Okay, which has a bond level of one and 9.5, or diamond does, because you've got each carbon atom has four bond pairs and no lone pairs, so you get the tetrahedral shape. Um, graphite. Well, that has a bond angle of 120 because you've essentially got um, uh, alternate single double bonds or you'd get delocalization. Uh, this, this sort of is effectively three bond pairs, 120. Ammonia, sorry, ammonia, you get uh, there's three bond pairs and one lone pair. So the lone pair distorts the bond angle. You get like 107.5, you get trigonal uh, pyramidal. Uh, this NH2, well, that's going to have two bond pairs and two lone pairs. That's very like water. Um, so you've got four pairs altogether. Lone pairs squash that bond angle down. You get more like 104.5 rather than 109. So our answer there is A. Which reaction has an enthalpy change? It's the standard enthalpy of formation. So enthalpy of formation is uh, elements in the standard state. and you're going to form one molar product. Well, they're all forming one molar product, so we can't A, A B, C, and D, so we can't distinguish on that. Uh, where are the elements in the standard state? Um, well, it's this one here, where silver is a solid, and iodine is a solid, it's half I2. Okay, incidentally, that one there, you've got gaseous ions forming the solid, that's a lattice entropy of formation. Um, and uh, D is just a bit of a red herring. Okay, here is a bond enthalpy calculation. Right, what's the enthalpy change of this reaction? Well, we're burning methane, so we can straight away, we can, we can say A and B are wrong because they're endothermic. That's not going to be it. Okay, so probably best to just draw the bonds here just to be on the safe side. So I'm going to draw, and we've got methane. And you have got uh, two oxygen molecules, double bond between the oxygens. And in the products, we're gonna have a carbon dioxide molecule and two water molecules. Okay, the way I like to do this is do a Hess's law triangle. So on this arrow, I'm gonna break up all of those bonds. 
So I'm going to have gaseous atoms down here. And then I'm going to build all the bonds back up again that way. And then we can find out delta H from the Hess's law triangle. Okay, so on the red arrow, we're breaking bonds. So that's going to be endo. So that's going to feel plus values. Well, we've got four times four, one, two for the carbon hydrogens. Uh, we're going to have two of those, two times four, nine, six. Uh, add all that up together, and we get a total of two, six, four, zero. We'll put the plus in there. Uh, on the green arrow, we are going to be making, um, well, we're going to be making two of those bonds, so it's two times seven, four, three. And we're going to be making four of those, so that's four times four, six, three. Add all that lot up together, we get three, 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 eight. Now, we remember that is going to be a negative sign because that is making bonds, which is exothermic. So finally, we just do delta H there. So delta H, the yellow arrow here, is going to be that's going to plus 2640 uh, minus 3338, which gives us minus 698 kilojoules. So that is the answer there. Okay, in which conversion is the metal reduced? So we need to look at the oxidation numbers of the metal. So just do one example. So I always do. Uh, work out the oxidation numbers. It's the sum, sigma, the sum of the oxidation numbers uh, is the charge on the species. Right. Oh. So we wiped everything there by mistake. Okay. So, sorry about that. The sum of the oxidation numbers is equal to the charge on the species. Okay, so let's look at that dichromate ion in A then. So we've got, look at this one here. So the charge is equal to minus two. We've got two chromium atoms that we don't know. Each oxygen is always minus two in its compound, so that's going to be minus 14. A little bit of algebra there, we've got two CR is equal to plus 12. And then CR is equal to plus six. Okay, so let's just show you how to do those. So that's plus six there, and that is also plus six. So there's no reduction or oxidation there. Manganese, well, if you do the same here, you find that that is a plus six there, and that's a plus seven. So that's actually been oxidized. The oxidation number's gone up, so it's not that one. Uh, this titanium one, it is um, plus four there and it's also plus four there so nothing's happening there the vanadium one though if we work that out that's plus five there and it is only plus four there so it's gone down there so it's reduced so our answer is d okay so we've got a rate expression for the rate of reaction and which statement is correct? The rate constant has units. Okay, so let's work out the rate constant units and it's just show that, that is, they're, they're not the right units, that's wrong. So we rearrange that, we get K is equal to rate, mole per decimal, sorry, mole rate over um, X squared, conk and Y. Well, the units of rate is always mole per decimeter cubed squared, decimeter cubed, uh, it's not squared, sorry. Uh, mole per decimeter. Mole dm to the minus three per second. And we've got three lots of concentration on the bottom there. That's mole dm to the minus three all cubed. So if you work that out, it's going to be, the units are going to be mole to the minus two, dm to the plus six per second. Okay, so it's not that. Now let's see B. What would happen if we halve the concentration of X? Well, it's second order, so that will make it uh, X halved. That will make it go down. I just do it this way. So we halve X. 
that's going to make it go down by one over two all squared. So that's times by it's going to be a quarter of its original value. And if we double y, well, that's going to make the rate go twice as fast because it's first order. So that means the reaction is going to be have a wee half of the normal uh, the rate. Okay, so that is correct. The rate is halved. And we'll just check the others aren't right. So C, right, X is tripled. Okay, if you, well, if you triple X, it's going to be X squared. So that's going to be times nine. And if you double Y, that's going to be times two. So that's going to give us overall, that's going to be times 18 faster. So that's not right. Okay, it's not not 16, it's 18. And finally, the rate constant is, that's wrong. The rate constant always changes. If temperature changes, it always goes bigger if you increase the temperature. So our answer there is B. Okay, uh, which statement about pH is correct? Uh, the pH of a weak base is independent of temperature. That's wrong because any equilibrium constant, you know, it's gonna, any kind of equilibrium constant will change with te as temperature changes. Okay, uh, at temperatures above 298, the pH pure water is less than seven. Now, strangely, that is correct, isn't it? Okay, because we just look at that. Well, here's our expression for Kw. Okay, the ionic product. And we know that when it's neutral, H plus conch is equal to OH minus conch. So in neutral water, well, only when it's neutral, Kw is equal to H plus squared. So H plus is equal to the square root of, sorry, H plus or H plus squared is equal to the square root of Kw. Now Kw gets bigger as temperature increases. So that means the hydrogen ion concentration here, that will get bigger as the temperature goes up. So that means the pH will go down. Okay, right, so that is the right answer. Um, C, the pH of nitric acid is approximately 3.2. Well, the pH of, well, the hydrogen ion concentration in nitric acid is going to be two moles per decimeter cubed minus log of two is actually equal to minus 0 0.30, not 0 0.30. So that's wrong. Um, finally, this one here, the pH of sulfuric acid and hydrochloric acid, the same concentration. Well, the sulfuric acid, because it's a dibasic acid, and hydrochloric is only monobasic, the sulfuric has got two times the concentration of hydrogen ions. So the pH of the sulfuric acid will be lower, not greater. So that so the correct answer is B. Okay. Um, so it's asking here, you're adding an acid to a, uh, an aqueous solution of base. Right, uh, which acid base has the highest equivalence point, right? So it just gets the pH curves here. Now we're actually adding to acids to base, so they're gonna be kind of maybe the other way around to what we normally draw them, starting off alkaline and then go acidic. There's pH at 14, seven. And here's the volume of, bait, volume of acid. Right, now this is a strong acid, sorry, this is a weak acid and a strong base. So you're going to get a pH curve, which goes something like that. It's got slightly alkaline endpoint there. All right. I'll do B in a minute. C, well, that's a strong acid and a strong um, base. So you're going to get that, something like that, the blue line. So the pH, that will be exactly 7, uh, the endpoint. Um, hydrochloric acid, well, that's a strong base and a weak alkali, so that's going to that's going to start off up here, but then go down there. So that's going to have a bit of an acidic pH. So A is obviously the right answer, and actually B will be about neutral because it's going to be a kind of a mixture. B will be a mixture of the um, of the red and the green. You're going to get something like that. Okay. So B uh, is the, sorry, um, B is the wrong answer. Not B, it's A, because that's going to have the highest equivalence point because it is, you know, it's, it's the highest pH because it's slightly alkaline.
That is our answer. 15. Okay. In a test for a halide ion, you add dilute nitric acid first before you add the silver nitrate. Why do you do that? Well, the answer is B. Oh, sorry. It prevents the precipitation of other silver compounds other than halides. In particular, so it, what it will do, it will destroy hydrogen carbonate ions, which will otherwise give you a precipitate of Ag, HCO3. That's insoluble. Uh, so add H plus to that. You get CO2 and water. Um, it will also get rid of carbonate ions, which will give you silver carbonate precipitate. Uh, just have two protons there and you get carbon dioxide and water again. And then finally, um, you'll also get rid of OH minus ions, which would give you a silver hydroxide precipitate. Um, it just obviously turns into water. Um, so, um, A, it will increase the concentration of nitric ions, nitrate ions, but that's not, then they spectate ions, they don't do anything, so that's just a red herring. Um, silver nitrate, that's just a load of rubbish, and um, um, the precipitation doesn't need acid, uh, acid conditions to work. Uh, B is the right answer there. Okay, 16. Major products form when chlorine reacts with cold dilute aqueous sodium hydroxide. So that's a year 12 topic. That's the year, that's the halogens topic. And you should know that if you uh, bubble chlorine through cold alkali, um, you get a disproportionation reaction occurring. I'll draw it as an ionic equation. You get chloride ions. Stay there reduced to the minus one. You get the chlorate, which is oxidized up to the plus one. And you'll get water as well. Uh, okay, so you get these two, sodium chloride and sodium chlorate. C is the right answer. Okay, this is uh, electronic configuration of a transition metal. Okay, don't forget, definition of a transition metal forms at least one ion with a partly filled D shell. Right, so this one is straight away is wrong. That's in the P block. It's not even in the D block, so forget about that. Um, likewise, this one here, well, 4S, that would be calcium, that atom. That's in the S block. It's not transition metal. Um, this one is a transition metal because it's going to form probably ions of like 2 plus, which will be 3D8. Um, which is uh, nickel, uh, actually. And this one here, well, that's that's zinc, right? And that will only form them. M2 plus ion will have a completely filled D shell, 3D10, uh, that's zinc 2 plus. Um, and that's not strictly a transition metal because it never forms, it doesn't form an ion with a partly filled D shell. So uh, our answer there is B. Okay. Now, which of these will not act as a ligand in the formation of complex ion? Well, you need a lone pair on a ligand, don't you? Right? You don't have a lone pair on, meth on the carbon and methane because you've got four bond pairs and you haven't got no lone, you haven't got any lone pairs. Carbon monoxide, yeah, you do have a, you have a lone pair on the carbon there that can act as a ligand. Um, water, obviously, you've got lone pairs on the oxygen. That's a ligand. And ammonia, you've got a lone pair on the nitrogen. So the one that can't is methane. 19, okay. Right, the correct oxidation state and coordination number of cobalt, okay, in this species here. Now let's have a look at it. We've got uh, CO, NH3, Cl, right, now that, comes with two chloride ions, okay? So that means you must have a two plus charge on that ligand there. Uh, so what's the charge on the cobalt? Well, the ammonia, sorry, the ammonia doesn't have any charge on it, those ligands, but the chloride, of course, is a minus one. So that means that this cobalt is gonna be the plus three oxidation state, yeah? So it's gonna be C or D, 
And the coordination number is six because you've got six ligands, each of which forms one. So strictly speaking, the coordination number is the number of dated bonds form into the metal. Well, it is six because you, each of those ligands forms one dated bond. D is our answer. Question 20, which is not correct. Cobalt, sorry, copper chloride 40 minus that isn't square planar, it's tetrahedral. It's a tetrahedral complex. Uh, NH4, that is tetrahedral. We've got four bond pairs and no lone pairs, so it will be tetrahedral. Bond angle is 109.5. Um, this, com this complex line with the bidentate ligand, that is octahedral because, of course, each of those, that nitrogen and that nitrogen forms a dated bond. So you've got a coordination number of six in it. So the shape is octahedral. That's correct. And this one is octahedral. We've got six water ligands. So the, the one that's incorrect is A. If you're looking for a square planar, um, you're looking for a square, square planar complex, and they quite often give an example of that, cis platin is probably the best example to give. That is square planar. That, that one there uh, is, is tetrahedral. Okay, which compound decolorizes acidified potassium manganate? Okay, so potassium manganate is an oxidizing agent, of course. And you should be probably familiar with this half equation using titrations in acid and um, in redox titrations. So it forms that's colorless, yeah. And that is purple. So you want something to provide electrons, you want a reducing agent. Okay, so copper, no, this one not, is not a reduce, copper two plus, not a good reducing agent. Um, iron here, well, we've got Fe two plus, which is easily oxidized up to Fe three plus. So that is a reducing agent. Yeah, that one is the answer. This one here, the iron is present in the Fe three plus state already. You can't really oxidize it any higher than that. And here we've got aluminium in the three plus state. Aluminium only forms three plus ions. So C is definitely our answer. Sulfate ions. Um, they don't have any reducing power at all. Sulfur is in its maximum oxidation state there. Uh, no reducing power. Okay, which has EZ isomers? Okay, now uh, we're going to have to draw some of these out, I think. Okay, so. Right, this first one, A. You'll see it doesn't because you have got two bromines on the carbon. And so you have the same thing. So you can't, you can't swap these two around. You get the same thing exactly. Uh, this one here, this can't either because you've got Here, I'm going to come back to that. I think we, it's a little bit, a bit ambiguous the way they have labeled this. We'll come back to that in a minute. The way they've written it. So that's, that's um, that can't form. That can't, that won't work because uh, these two hydrogens, if you swap them about, they're the same. We'll give you the same thing. Um, C2H4Br. Well, that it doesn't, there's no double bond in that because you've got six things joining onto the carbon. So that can't possibly have EZ isomers. Likewise, there's no double bonds in that. So that means A must be the answer. Now I've drawn A like that, but I suppose you could have A uh, the way that they're not, they haven't given the structural formula, they just given the molecular formula. So you could have that, couldn't you? And that does show you Z isomerism because in that case, of the, I've drawn the Z form because I've got the two high priority groups, the bromines on the same side. Um, swap, swap these around and you've got the E form. So A is the best answer there. Okay, which is the mechanism for this conversion? Uh, it's a bit of a red herring here because um, you're trying to make things electrophilic substitution, but of course that benzene ring, because it's got benzene in it, that benzene ring is not reacting at all. Nothing happens to that. The only thing that happens is you're swapping a hydrogen there for a chlorine. So it's going to be substitution. And if you remember uh, to do that, it's got to be, it's basically like substituting methane, but they've just 
put a benzene on to confuse you. If you if you do that, well, the conditions would be UV light, wouldn't it? And chlorine and it's um, free radical substitution. So I think the, the one that might fill you is maybe to think electrophilic substitution, but it's not. Okay. Okay, the mechanism for this conversion. Oh, sorry, that's the same question. We'll copy it in twice. 24, which compound decolorizes bromine water in the absence of sunlight? So we're not talking about free radical uh, things, okay. Um, right. Now, it's a bit mean the way they've done this, right? So first of all, that's saturated, so that's not going to react with bromine water, no electrophilic addition. That's what we're talking about here. It is possible because you haven't got a double bond. Uh, this, it looks like it's unsaturated, but you've got electron delocalization, so that won't work either. No, no electrophilic addition there. Uh, this molecule has got no double bonds in it. If you draw it out, this one, if you draw it out, CH3, CH2, CH must be a double bond there. Okay, that has got a double bond, so that will react with bromine water. Uh, D is the answer. <clears throat> okay, which compound reacts to form a ketone when react with acidified solution of potassium dichromate? Now, if you remember that, to get a ketone, you need a secondary alcohol. Okay, if you react to secondary alcohol, you remove that H there and you form a ketone. It's got to be a secondary alcohol. Well, it's not A because that's a primary alcohol. Um, B, we draw out B there. It's a little bit confusing when they're drawn like that. Got two CH3s. Well, we've got an H. We've got an OH and you can see that that is actually a secondary alcohol. So B is the answer. We'll just check the other ones. Right, this is an aldehyde. That will be actually oxidized to a carboxylic acid. So that's right, that's wrong. And D is a carboxylic acid. You can't oxidize that any further. So B is the only answer. <clears throat> now 26, which does not contain an asymmetric carbon atom, okay? drawing here as well so an asymmetric carbon atom we want something with um four different groups attached to one carbon right if you look at this one here that is a that's four different groups you've got an ethyl group you've got a hydrogen a chlorine and a methyl so it's not d um Let's look at B, let's at C, right. Um, has that got an asymmetric carbon? Well, this one here appears to be asymmetric. Okay, that one there, you've got a methyl, a hydrogen, um, an OH, and then the final group is you've got that there. So that, that does, that, that has, that's got an asymmetric carbon as well. Uh, B, right, so this one is asymmetric. You've got there, you've got a hydrogen. You've got a methyl. You've got an ethyl there. And you've got this propyl group. So it must be A. Let's just draw out A, okay? Uh, so A, it's, it's difficult when they're drawn in a line like that and brackets all over the place. It's a good idea to draw it out. CH, all right, so you've got CH there. You've got another methyl there. And then we've got CH2, CH3 there. You can see, well, see that this, this is the only candidate that could possibly be asymmetric. And it's not asymmetric because you've got two methyl groups attached to that there. So <clears throat> uh, A is the correct answer. 27, which reaction involves addition elimination? Now addition elimination, if you remember, is the reaction between a carbonyl compound, such as an acyl chloride, uh, and an alcohol or an amine. Uh, okay, so we're looking for that, and that's where you get, you know, this starts off to that attacks that carbon. You break, <coughs> you break that, and then it reforms later. 
Okay, so let's have a look at that. Um, this first one here is all you are doing there is you are you're dehydrating, aren't you? You is it's elimination that one, so that's not right. You're removing a water molecule. <clears throat> B is actually the correct answer because look, you've got an acyl chloride group reacting with it's actually a, not strictly speaking an alcohol because it's on a benzene ring, it's a phenol group, but yeah. It is, here's our acyl chloride. Acyl chloride, that's going to react with a phenol group. That's going to start it off going like that. So that's the answer there. Let's just whiz through the other ones. This is addition. Okay, the chlorine is adding across the double bond. And this one here, you were swapping the bromine for the OH minus, that's nucleophilic substitution. So B is the answer there. It's a good test of all your knowledge of organic mechanisms. Right. Um, Copy this question twice, 28, let's have it. I've copied that a few times. Right, 28. That was 28. Uh, now, for some reason, they have a, they, it's not me who's made a mistake here. There's no question 29 on this paper. Uh, oh, there is 29, sorry. Okay. okay. <clears throat> um, it says there which, co which, which compound forms a polymer uh, with the um, with a diacyl chloride. Question 29. Which one forms the polymer with this? So you've got six of those, and you've got a diacyl chloride like that. Right now, <clears throat> the acyl chloride, this can react with an alcohol or an amine group. And the correct answer there is you have is A because you have. 1, 2, diaminoethane. So you have an ethane with an, uh, an amine group, primary amine, at each end. So the answer to that one is A. Right, question 30. Which structure shows the zwitterine of an amino acid? Now, zwitterine, that means it's got one positive charge on the NH, on the, uh, okay. Just draw this out. Zwitterine means, so there's your, General formula for an amino acid. It's got one, the so the NH2 is protonated, and the carboxylic acid here is deprotonated. So you've got zwitter means two, zwei means two. You've got two charges, right? Now, um, so it could possibly be to be A or B or C. Okay, but we're going to eliminate A because the R chain. Uh, on Na, well, that's also got a charge on it. So it's got three charges on it. It's not really a zwitterion. Likewise, the, the R group here has got a carboxylic acid, which is uh, ionized. So that's it's not a zwitterion. Uh, this thing is just wrong. Um, so the answer is D, because that has only got two charges, one on the NH2 and one on the carboxylic acid. <coughs> And the R group in that amino acid, which you see in the data sheet there, is actually cysteine. That can't be uh, protonated or deprotonated at normal pHs. Yeah. Okay, 31, we have a, a titration sort of redox. Minimum volume in centimeters cubed of manganate needed to oxidize 0.1 mole of the VO2 plus ion. Okay, so we can see... Uh, look at this, the stoichiometry, the ratio in the reactant, you need, you're going to need five, sorry, you're going to need five VO2s for one MnO4. So the moles of this one you need is going to be 0 0.02 divided by five. Um, so 0.01, sorry. Uh, moles, that is equal to <clears throat> two times 10 to the minus three moles. So what volume of manganate do we need then? Well, volume is 
equal to moles over concentration. We've got two times 10 to the minus three moles and the concentration is um, The concentration is 0 0.02. So you do that, that's equal to 0 0.1 dm cubed, which is 100 centimeters cubed. So C is our answer there. Okay, 32, which is the concentration of sodium hydroxide? That has a pH of 14.3. So, right, we know that, we know that the Hydrogen ion concentration is going to be 10 to the power of minus pH, so 10 to the minus 14.3. That works out to be. <coughs> 5.01 times 10 to the minus. Uh, 15, okay. Right, now we're going to use, um, we know that OH minus concentration, rearrange our expression for KW, KW over H plus concentration. So that's gonna be one times 10 to the minus 14 divided by that. And that gives an answer of 1.995 moles per decimeter cubed. Um, so the closest one there is two, two moles per decimeter cube sodium hydroxide. Um, right, thirty-three. Right, the units of rate comes for third order reaction, which we had earlier in the in the thing actually. So in the third order reaction, you've got rate is k, and let's say x to the power of three. So rearrange that, we get K is rate over X cubed. All right, what's the units of rate? Always mole per decimeter cubed per second. And we've got three concentration terms, so that, that's mole dm to the minus three cubed. All right, so of course that's gonna cancel out, that's become squared. So it's gonna be mole to the minus two, dm to the plus six, second to the minus one. D is the answer. All right, what is the pH of 0 0.015 moles of sulfuric acid? Well, we have to remember sulfuric acid, it is a dibasic acid. So one mole of sulfuric acid ionizes to give us two moles of H plus ions. So in the concent if you've got sulfuric at that concentration, the H plus is actually double that. Uh, which is equal to point. Zero, 0.03. Now we do the minus log to find the pH minus log of 0 0.03 is equal to 1.52. I think you get 1.82 if you forget to double the hydrogen ion concentration there. Which compound is formed when phenyl benzene carboxylate is hydrolyzed under acidic conditions. So let's draw out <coughs> what phenyl benzene carboxylate looks like. Right, we have got uh, this comes from phenol, this comes from benzoic acid. If you hydrolyze it, right, water, we're going to stick um, an OH onto there and the H goes on to there, so we're going to get phenol and benzene carboxylic acid. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so that isn't formed. You don't get an aldehyde, obviously. You don't get a ketone. You get D, which is that carboxylic acid there. <coughs> right, and 36, the last question on the paper. Okay. Right, 36, it says, 
Um, the student rinse the apparatus before starting an acid-based titration. Titration showed the volume of the acid was larger, larger volume of acid from the burette. The answer, right, uh, the pot, what could cause this? It said, A, the conical flask was rinsed with water before the titration. Now that you should do that, no problem with that. B, the walls of the conical flask were rinsed during the titration. That's okay. That won't do it. <coughs> C, the pipette was rinsed only with water. Um, that would uh, make the, the volume lower because it would dilute the, the alkali. You have less alkali than you should. And D, it says the burette was rinsed with water only. And that would do it. That would dilute the acid, so you'd need more of it. And that is the end of the paper.